on this computer. Here we go. So welcome to Art 244. The first question that we have to deal with tonight is um, how to choose a topic, uh, a, something that we want to sculpt. And that there's several things that that is about that. Um, some of it is your background. You know, have you been exposed to art before? Do you have areas of art that you're interested in? Have you taken an art history class where you may have seen sculpture before? You know, those are the kinds of things that can help prime us and guide us towards sculpting something. Um, like I was telling you guys last week, I happened to have lots of interest and early exposure to um, museums. My folks took me to art museums when we were living in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and they had um, art books on the coffee table. And so I was able to see examples from ancient Egypt, ancient Greece, and ancient Rome. And so I really got interested in the idea of making sculpture and cast bronze and uh, figurative sculpture. I've always been really, really super interested in the human figure. I've been drawing portraits and drawing bodies forever. And I always thought that the human figure was like the highest calling, the greatest challenge in art. Um, uh, I've always thought that the, the nude figure in art um, takes everything that's wonderful about the human figure, um, our strength, our vitality, our spirituality, our sense, our, our uh, searching for um, some kind of human transcendence and puts it all together in a really heroic package. And so seeing all of the sculptures of heroes and you know, heroic uh, treatment of the human form in sculpture, whether it's all the way back to um, classical antiquity and you know, ancient Greece, or whether it's in the current, uh, the current day, I was really interested to see what people were doing with um, the human figure. I've always been drawn to the figure. You know, I really, um, I find it to be a very compelling art form. And over the last 40 years of my career, I've dealt with all kinds of pushback on people who don't want me to do the human figure. Um, my teachers, when I was in high school and college, didn't want me doing the human figure because the really cool thing at the time um, that they had learned when they were in college and high school um, was expressionism and abstraction. Um, that was the hot stuff, the hot topic in the middle of the 20th century. And so by the 1960s and 70s, it was like, well, why don't you like to do abstraction? Abstraction is much more intellectually um, uh, challenging. Uh, you'd be much more courageous as a sculptor, you know, if you were doing abstract things. And I always come back to the naturalistic representational, you know, human figure, um, whether it's this wax pattern that I keep sculpting on for the demonstrations or these things that we do in the sculpture class for human figure study. Um, because I've always thought that, you know, I was, I was very interested in tradition. I was not interested in throwing out tradition um, like most of modernism did in the 20th century throughout all of the traditional art forms to try to explore and discover new ones. Well, all of that exploration was wonderful, um, but lots of it led to dead ends, you know, in terms of um, where to go with art and abstraction. Um, the, express, the abstract expressionists took it all the way down to just throwing paint on canvas. Um, and kind of wallowing in paint after a while. And so, you know, when you throw away all of the forms and the techniques and everything and just play with paint, you know, at some point you've hit some kind of cul-de-sac or dead end, you know, artistically. So I like the human figure and I like naturalistic representational stuff. Out here in the West, we have a strong native tra tradition, native, um, of people doing Western art. And so those of you who really enjoy Western art, like Frederick Remington sculptures of, you know, cowboys and bucking broncos and grizzly bears and, um, you know, people in gunfights and all that kind of stuff. There's a rich, huge tradition of Western art, especially in cast bronze sculpture um, that you can, you know, look at. And so to use search terms in a Google image search for Western art, Frederick Remington, um, 
Western cast bronze, Western art will take you into that genre of art, that that um, area of art that just deals with, you know, cowboys and Indians, um, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, large scale um, mammals in the West, elk, bears, deer, bison, all of that kind of stuff. So you, if you're ever, if you were ever interested really in what a wolf looks like, uh, a howling wolf or an Ameri you know, American bison or um, the Roosevelt elk that we have out here in the, in the West, like in uh, Oregon, um, you, could, you could do worse than to just do um, something that was uh, a four-legged uh, creature uh, and we could cast that really nicely. I don't have anything in that size except this. So again, I would probably try to keep it in a relatively small size. Oh, I, I wore a black shirt, so it's really hard to see this stuff. But again, this is about, the bird here is about six inches tall. And if you could do a bison or an elk or something that was about six inches tall, it would wind up being about six or seven inches long. And that would be really cool. Um, if you have an interest in something abstract, please go ahead and do something that is um, an exploration of abstraction. I don't mean to um, badmouth abstract art. And so I really keep wanting to hold up something like this piece here because um, this is just a really wonderful exploration of organic form. Um, and, uh, you know, this is very, it, you know, again, deceptively simple, although, you know, kind of interesting and it's different and it's very engaging to the viewer from all different sides and angles. And so you can do something quite, um, quite abstract. Um, and also if it's more of a linear form rather than a really big, huge volumetric form, like a, um, a sphere of some kind, um, you can cast this solid, and yet there's still relatively little bronze in here because of this big negative space in the middle. That's the key, is that um, you can do things that are more linear in nature, and when they've got lots of long limbs or um, negative spaces or something like that in the sculpture, that um, allows you to not ca uh, spend as much money on bronze, on just you know heavy, thick, uh, bronze castings. And so um, you get a lot more bang for your buck when you keep things in kind of a linear format like this. Um, so well, I was going to do a couple of things. I wanted to show you what my work was kind of like and how I approach my work. And I got to go back to the chat because there's mo lots more stuff about here. Um, I have questions about straws. With small pieces, are we going to have to put them in? And the official nomenclature name for them um, and grinding, will a Dremel tool work on small pieces? Okay. Um, I think I'm going to do all of the gating, uh, creating the gating systems for the sculptures. And so you won't have to put any straws on the sculptures. I, you can use straws internally inside the sculpture if you want that to be a supporting armature for the wax. But I generally don't put any internal armature, any internal skeleton structure of anything like wood or straws or something inside my sculptures. I'm just really sculpting at this scale, directly in wax and solid in wax. And that tends to work out the best for me. Some people also use drinking straws, plastic drinking straws for the gating system that we would use for the um, casting process, but I have all different kinds of extruded wax in different sizes and thicknesses, and I will apply the gating system for all of your sculptures. So all we have to do for the first five or six weeks is just sculpt our object and work on that. Um, don't think you're recording. I see a video where they used it. Okay, very good. Okay, excellent. And I'm, I'm to the end of the chat stuff now. So um, let me just da, 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 try to talk about how I sculpt. Um, I'm going to be showing you uh, imagery that I work with and imagery that it's on paper because I always have to have some kind of a um, 
a visual resource to sculpt off of. I can't make stuff up just from my brain. I'm actually gonna, I need to do the research ahead of time and find imagery or work with a model to create my own imagery so that I can do stuff. And so what I usually do is I take, I work with models and I have drawn models in the past where I've asked them to pose nude for me and I draw the model and I've got then the drawings that I can make the sculptures out of. Recently, not recently, in the last 20 years or so, I've been photographing models and I've been doing it very professionally and very discreetly. And so when I photograph a model, I then take the photograph and run it through a Photoshop program to create a line drawing of the model in the pose that they are in. So this person worked with me about three years ago and um, was really interested in doing lots of um, dance and stretching and backbendy kinds of stuff. And so came up with this kind of a composition here. So I Photoshopped this and made this into a, um, a line drawing so that I could use it. It doesn't look like the person so that I'm not you know, actually showing you a, a, a full color nude photograph of somebody. And I feel like I can have this kind of thing laying around on my desktop, on my workspace, while students are in the classroom, and that this doesn't have an uncomfortable, sexual, whatever kind of a possible connotation to it, because it has been transformed into a line drawing. So I worked with this person doing a variety of different stretchy, uh, bendy, whatever kinds of poses. And that gives me the basis of the thing that I want to work on. And let's just see if I've got something else. Yeah, this is this is a good one. Okay, so um, these backbend things were really interesting to me. I thought that they were very expressive and wonderful and everything. And so I started to do a series of these kinds of sculptures. And I may continue to do that kind of series uh, of sculpture uh, when I sculpt along with you guys in the classroom, in the virtual classroom this quarter. So what I do, how do I work? Well, I generally do a standing figure of my model and then I make a mold of it. So I have made this plaster two-piece mold of one of my models. Um, I, I sculpted a standing figure with, this, with the arms down at the sides and I put in maybe 40 or 50 hours just sculpting that sculpture to make sure that it, the, all of the forms and proportions looked like the models, that the hairstyle and the facial features looked like the model, so that then I had a basic figure that I could cast in wax and then make my sculptures out of this. So I think there's a wax pattern in this thing. So I'm going to open this thing up carefully if I can because I cast this thing in wax, I don't know, a year or two ago and have left it in the mold the entire time until now. This mold is a two-piece mold that parts in the middle. And so as I open it up, I'm opening up a crack and the, the wax that's inside is, if there's a little bit of an undercut or something in the wax, it's, it's kind of making it a little bit more difficult for me to get this thing open, but I'm gonna to try to slowly wiggle, 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 carefully get this thing apart and see how I did. So I lost, I broke off one hand so far and I'm gonna to have to put the hand back on here, but this is the, the sculpture inside of the, um, the mold. And so now I'm gonna to try to pry the front part of this sculpture out of the mold. And I didn't really think I'd be doing this in real time in front of God and everybody and people, but I'm going to attempt this to see if I can make this work. Uh, usually when I'm doing this, I'm doing it with a, a more freshly cast piece of wax that hasn't been inside the mold for um, several months to a year. And so I am, I better put this down here so you guys can see what I'm up to here. So I am working on this thing and I'm actually using my butter knife to pry this thing out of the mold and it's coming out in pieces. So I will have to put it back together, but that's okay. So here is, this was the pouring cup on top of the head, which was gonna break off anyway and get replaced. So that's the torso and the arms. 
I have a couple of legs that are coming out of here, leg form, leg form. And I'm not uh, too upset about this. Come on out of there, leg form. Come on, the toes are kind of grabbing down there. Come on, leg form. Okay, there's another leg form. And the hand, where are we over here? The hand came out with the leg form right there. The hand is kind of attached by the fingertips. So anyway, this was a mold that I made around the original wax sculpture that I did. You guys are not going to do this. You're going to cast, you're going to make your pieces that are going to be one of a kind pieces. And then we're going to cast that one off piece as a bronze casting. But since I have to try to figure out how to not reinvent the wheel every time, I came up with this little shortcut so that I had a human figure that looked a lot like my model that I could work with. And then what I do is I actually take the body and the, my body parts and I cut them apart. So I'm gonna try to get you back up here so that you can see me again. And so I'm gonna take my body parts like this and then cut them apart with a knife. Now, one thing that I was not able to give all of you guys is your own um, uh, craft knife. This is a craft knife that uh, carpenters use and drywall people and roofers use craft knives. I have about five or six of them here in the classroom, but I was not gonna go out and buy a craft knife for everybody. I'm sorry, you guys are gonna have to come up with your own sharp knife. Many of you have X-Acto knives that you can use. Um, if you have taken an art class before, you might have an X-Acto knife like this or a snap blade knife of some kind, but it's nice to have a razor knife of some kind with a razor blade, sharp um, blade on it, replaceable knife blade, so that you can cut into your wax when you need to cut the wax. So I'm gonna take my knife and cut off my arms really quickly here. When you're cutting wax, especially when you're cutting cold wax, be careful. Um, you don't wanna um, kind of bust through the wax and then bury that knife blade in the soft part of your skin, like your thumb or something. You have to be really careful when you're doing this. So I'm gonna put my arm back together again so that that arm goes back together and cut the other arm off. And what I wind up doing with my sculptures is I cut the head off. I cut the torso in about three spots. And then I look and see where the pose that I'm going to sculpt, where does it bend? Where does it have to bend? And then I carefully slice and cut and make uh, the, the kind of cuts that I need so that I can weld my arms and legs and torso back together to accommodate these bends so that it'll go back together. You guys are probably gonna work a little bit differently and I'm gonna walk you through that process in just a second, just as soon as I get this apart. I kind of wanted to cut this apart on camera so that you guys could see that there's nothing really sacred about um, sculptures or wax patterns or something. You build them, you can take them apart, you can put them back together. And um, a lot of people totally freak out. Like, you know, they say, I made this sculpture and it's absolutely perfect and I don't want anything bad to happen to it. And oh my God, what happens if it falls apart? It's gonna fall apart and we're gonna put it back together. And we're gonna do that several times over the course of the quarter and it'll be fine. So I've got a great big pile of my pieces and parts here that I'm going to kind of um, put together into one of these uh, poses. Uh, and then I'm gonna work on that for the class this quarter. This, um, this file folder that I have that's filled up with these photographs, this is what I want you to try to do. This is your research. You have to go online and find the kinds of imagery that you're interested in and uh, print them out or draw them out or something like that so that you have um, at least one, if not several versions of the image that you're interested in. If it's an elk, you're gonna need several views of the elk. You're gonna want a side view and a quarter away view and a quarter towards you view and a straight on view so that you can see the different sides of that elk because you have to synthesize all of those views and put them together into a synthetic three-dimensional creation. 
the thing about art is that it's not just one dimensional or you don't just view it from one side like a drawing or a sculpture i'm sorry a drawing painting or a photograph sculpture is about um the object in the round and so we really have to understand the volumes and uh the form from all different sides which is really interesting um let's see paula said i have one i don't know what she's talking about anymore you have a straw you saw a video where they did it what is she talking about here uh she was talking about she has a box cutter i think oh she's got a knife okay that's good fantastic so I don't know if you guys remember this nasty little critter, and I sure should have worn my light gray sweat um, uh, t-shirt this time, but I wanted to start off the class, maybe doing the first a day or the first week or so, trying to do a small, simple sculpture uh, in wax so that you guys can work directly in wax. Um, gosh, I did not do any prep for today I was I went away and I, I have a 16 year old at home so I was debriefing him about his high school today and then I made dinner and then I came back here but um, what you're supposed to do for this class for working on your sculpture is plug in the light uh, for your hot box and then clamp the lamp to the top edge of the box so that the lamp shines in and shines down on your wax so that your wax gets warm after about 20 minutes or so so that with warm wax you can tear it off into little bits and then push it together with it, what we call the additive process where you just take in little bits of wax and jamming them together with your thumbs and fingertips to create from a from a very small piece of wax um, a larger more elaborate form that looks that that we rough out in the additive process, and then maybe switch over to um, using a combination of additive and subtractive process, where I like to use the Italian sculpting tool for this, because I can then support the sculpture in my hand, especially if it's been allowed to sit overnight and has gotten down to room temperature like this one does. This one is no longer as um, soft and pliable and easy to break as it was when I was uh, putting it together in the additive process. So I've been scraping off and trying to take off the high spots on this, on this elongated neck on this cat to try to make more, a much more elegant, um, delicate taper from the body of the cat down here and the shoulders, a long, delicately tapered neck up to the head. And then we would do the same thing with the actual head. But you can see that I'm using my support hand here. My fingers are, are carefully supporting the neck and the length of this linear form so that I can apply some pressure. And with the serrated edge of my sculpting tool, I am slowly kind of working down that surface, taking the high spots off, taking the, the tops of the bumps off, and getting to something, maybe if I put it right in front of my face, we can see it, something that has a lot more of a very uniform um, curve and um, kind of taper to it. This is a long tapering form. And so um, that's what I'm trying to get to is something that's much longer um, with a smooth, almost featureless taper that's a little bit tighter up at the top of the neck right underneath the head and then tapers tapers out um, with a slight curve to where the shoulders would be and the shoulders are really way down here the body of the cat is only uh this portion of the cat down here is the body this is where the legs and shoulders and belly of the cat are down here where my you know finger and thumb are and then the abstraction here was the you know, incredible elongation of the cat's neck up to the head that's way up above, which makes this thing kind of ridiculous on the one hand and also um, quite lovely as a sculpture, as an abstract sculpture on the other hand. And that's why when I was doing the Google image search for cast bronze sculpture cats, 
um, you know, I was looking around at all the different cats and many of them were naturalistic and representational. And, you know, that was wonderful. I was looking for something different, something artistic, maybe something from a certain movement um, of art. And this really felt like a, um, an Art Deco cat from about the 1920s to 1930s. Art Deco was the early part of the 20th century. It was a whole bunch about geometric um, abstraction and modernism. And then it was also kind of going on at about the same time that the Surrealist movement was happening in Europe, especially in France, Surrealism uh, in painting. Uh, and, and other kinds of abstraction like cubism were happening in the 1920s and 1930s. And so um, all of those isms, all of those movements in art were kind of going back and forth and inter um, pollinating each other, cross pollinating each other. And so something like this really super long neck cat is both surrealism and, you know, a little bit of, um, uh, I just had it and then I lost it again. Uh, anybody else have it? Um, uh, the movement that I started talking about three minutes ago. Uh, Art Deco? Art Deco, thank you. Art Deco. And Art Deco seems like a lot more of an American movement. It was uh, really popular in America with American artists and may not have been quite so much um, in Europe. Um, in Europe, after World War I and before World War II, um, they were more interested in cubism and surrealism to a, to a greater extent. And so um, seeing the cross-pollination across the pond was kind of an interesting thing. Anyway, I'm gonna continue sculpting on this little thing, but I also was, you know, I was so proud of all of my cameras here because I have so many cameras and so many angles to work with. So I have to really try to figure out if I can actually run one of these cameras so you can see what I'm up to and what I'm working on. Um, while I set that camera up, I was going to go around and ask you guys the question, the $64 question, the question that will put you on edge or, um, you know, in on the spot, because I'm going to ask you if you know what you're going to sculpt yet, or if you've already started sculpting on it. And I see Zoe sculpting feverishly on her webcam, so she must be working on something. So, um, Let's just see. I've got I've got my alpha list right here. So I'm going to ask, you know, Donovan, are you here? Are you do you know what you want to sculpt? If you can just unmute your mic to just say, you know, I haven't chosen something yet or to tell us what what thing you might be interested in. That'll kind of help us play the game a little bit. So Donovan Bosch, are you here today? Not seeing him on the list for some reason. I thought he was here. Okay, um, Christopher Belial, Belial, you're up next. Is any chance? There we go. What do you I'm think? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Um, maybe uh, percussion, like. Uh, well, you are breaking up. I, I'm only catching every other syllable. Could oh. you say it again slower? Like a marimba mallet? A marimba mallet. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Okay. Um, let me think now. Is that, a, is that a small headed mallet with a round thing on the end of it? It's like a stick and then a ball at the end. Stick and then ball at the end. Okay. So, and I really would strongly suggest that the stick still be made out of wood because a long bronze stick that's thin or even a tapering bronze stick is bronze is 99% copper. And so it's going to be soft and malleable. And if you're hitting and making impact with it, it's going to bend over time. Um, it's not, it, and it's going to be heavy too. So um, making mallets and that kind of thing, you might actually want to just form the marimba mallet heads and then use a hardwood stick um, that would have been used for the marimba um, mallets themselves and then mount your bronze ones to those. Are you a percussionist? Yeah. Okay. Do you have a set of marimbas? 
No, I wish I did. But oh, I have, okay. I have a pair of mallets. Good. That I can that's, base it off of. That's cool. That's good. Um, do you have a drum kit? Do you have drumsticks? Uh, yeah. Okay. And I'm assuming that the marimba mallets. I've I was in concert band. I've seen a variety of mallets and drumsticks and st and things like that. So I I'm picturing in my mind what you're talking about. So that's a good idea and it's a good start. And maybe you'll come up with something else because it might take you about 10 minutes yeah. to formulate, you know, a round ball in bronze that's about three quarters of an inch in diameter. And so yeah. um, you'll be sitting around not doing anything for four weeks <laughs> if that's all you cast. So good. Let's 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 move, keep moving. Audrey, you're next on my on that list. Um, do you have um, any ideas about what you might want to work on? Oh, I'm tossing around either making an elephant for my daughter. I have a, quite a few or a hippo. I don't know, a moose. Too many to choose from. Too many ideas to choose from. Okay, well, yeah. that's good. Did you get a chance to do any online or... Um, you know, library or encyclopedia um, looking to try to find images of something that you might be able to work on? Yeah, I found one of a moose um, and then there's one of a hippo that I thought about, um, kind of like where the mouth is open and he's in that like as a tray to hold something. Yeah. Um, so kind of it's like drawing that out in a way. And then my son's very artistic, so. He can try it out better than I can. So he's going to hook you up. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, That's yeah. good. Okay. Well, keep going here. Thank you. I'm writing these things down on my class list so that I can try to associate you with your project. That's a great way for me to try to keep you guys all straight because otherwise <laughs> I get everybody confused and all of your projects confused. So, Audrey, you are associated now with elephant, moose, hippo concept right now. Um, okay. Christian Chase, what, have you got any ideas that you, what, something you want to work on? Uh, yeah, so um, real quick, I kind of, oh, well, I guess I can't really show you right now. I kind of started on to, you know, kind of doing what I was doing last time I was here. I was making these little uh, animal heads. Yeah. Uh, um, right now I've got I, I've got the majority of a deer head going and the majority of, I, I started sculpting my dog, which has kind of been convenient because I can have her like right in front of me, um, a moving model. But um, something I, I really wanted to ask you about was um, I, I got engaged in April and I got some carving wax and I wanted to make my own wedding band um and i see that they use a lot of similar tools um but it you know a lot of it it's more like carving than sculpting um yeah. let, that... let me let me jump in here um that sounds like a wonderful project and yes you could make wedding bands um in in wax and that's how um they get cast especially one-of-a-kind artistic um wedding bands the one, however, the, there's a but here. Um, bronze is 99% copper, and it's it's so it's not hypoallergenic, and it will you know put a green uh, stain on your finger where you're wearing it all day long every day. Right. And so that's why they cast that wedding bands, especially in gold, because that doesn't that's a a pretty noble uh, metal, and it doesn't react with anything else. And so it wears really well and it doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. So think about that. Um, some other kind of wedding um, uh, jewelry piece that could be like a pin or a pendant that could be worn on a gold chain or something like that might be better than a ring. A ring has, you know, constant contact with your um, skin and so it's picking up on all of your oils and acids and everything in your skin and it turns the inside green and it will turn your finger green and then your finger will get mad and want to fall off so just a, a now, cautionary note as you're starting out on a project like that yeah you, so it, one thing i was kind of wondering is if if i had 
a good chunk of either gold or silver, what are the chances of me being able to cast that? Well, the chances, um, the chances you know. are good. Um, but okay. I, can't, I can't cast it. Um, that's where you might want to reach okay. out to jewelry makers in town and see if anybody's casting um, gold rings. Um, gold and silver are usually cast in a centrifugal caster where it, it swings around it really fast under spring loading. And so you put the molten gold in the middle of this thing and then you um, remove the safety and this thing flings the gold into the uh, mold with centrifugal force. Um, and they get really good results that way. It sounds super dangerous, but you're only using a tablespoon full of, of molten gold at the time. And this thing is all covered. Um, but I, I can't cast gold myself because I don't have a centrifugal okay. caster or that kind of material. So um, maybe try to find yourself one of the jewelry stores could maybe refer you to a, um, a custom jeweler who has the casting set up and you could bring them your rings in wax and they could cast them for you. Okay, so cool. That, that, that's an idea. Um, anyway, thank you. I got to keep moving here. Jordan Crawford, are you yes. here? All right. How you doing? Yeah, I'm here. Well, I'm good. Have you had any chance to think about this? And there's no harm, no foul if you don't have an idea yet. But we're starting to have to come up with something because we have to start sculpting something. So do you have any ideas of something you might be interested in sculpting for bronze casting? Um, a little bit. I was talking to uh, Hunter Van Curler because he uh, told me he had taken the class before and he was make and he made like a little like figurines he said or something like that so i'm thinking around doing like two to three little things but i'm just not positive on what i would like to do yet okay that sounds good and if you start making human figures now you can just make them as a little standing figure and then we can always uh, bend them into a pose later on because especially if they're only about this big uh, as a standing human figure they'll have relatively thin arms and legs and it's pretty easy to you know bend it at the waist and bend it at the back and bend the arms and legs into an action move if you think that it's going to have a particular posture or pose in life so you okay. can start, start with a standing figure and that would be fine all right uh, Matthew are you here Oh uh, yeah. Um, so what I'm thinking about doing is like uh, a head and it's got like a wide open mouth. It's like kind of yelling and like anger. It's like uh, like a representation of 2020. Gotcha. Okay. Very good. I appreciate that. Um, it, you may just have to try to keep it relatively small because a uh, head is a kind of a volumetric form like a ball. And so as it gets bigger, it, it scales up in, as a mass of bronze really quickly. And so if it's relatively small, like two or three inches tall, you know, that's a good size and that might be like a $15 casting. But as soon as it gets to be three or four inches tall by a couple, three inches wide, you know, it's solid bronze and it can wind up being much more expensive to cast like 30 or $40. So try to keep the size and scale of it relatively small, two inches if you can, okay? Thank you, thank you. All right, let's see, I got uh, Hunter Fossler on or next and uh, then Paula Fugate on deck. So Hunter, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Have you been able to think about stuff that you might be interested in for this project? Uh, yeah, I'm currently um, trying to sculpt a Pegasus. It's tech It's basically just a horse with wings. Wow. Okay. That's really cool. I had a girl, excuse me, young woman in my class a year ago who did a Pegasus. In fact, she was so proud of this thing that we made the plaster mold of it and then we cast three or four of them for her um, uh, but she had to take the class twice to be able to make that happen because the first time she sculpted the one pegasus and we didn't even get it cast in the first quarter but she got an a in the class just for sculpting such a magnificent thing the pegasus was about 
four inches tall by about five inches long. And then the wings were about, you know, four inches long each wing um, off the back side of the, of the horse. It's a very wonderful uh, piece. Good luck with that. I'll, I'll be happy to work with you on that one. Um, so Paula and then Zoe Lockhart would be after her. Paula, do you have, oh yeah, you guys were showing me all the stuff you were already sculpting. Um, and no, I actually, I haven't started mine yet. Um, oh. I do have share screen. Can I do that? Yes. Well, I have to enable it. Let me go down here and click a button. So multiple. Okay, you're on. And so it was it was just an image. I'm going to do this on a really small scale, like you said, to fit in the palm of my hand. Is yeah. that showing up yet? Um, it's here. There. It comes. It's coming. Oh, it's so cute. What is it? <laughs> it's it's a it's an otter, and I figured that I would probably do it maybe three or four inches long by maybe two to three inches wide and less than two inches high yeah um i have some personal images too i i like otters i okay. was i was lucky enough to find one in the middle of highway 58 once he's up at the zoo now oh my gosh okay. yeah so i have a bunch of, i have a bunch of pictures <laughs> wow okay yeah. um so for me the most um the most recognizable otter form would be one that was actually swimming weightless in water. Um, this one is cute, but he's all curled up and it's kind of hard to know what this round faced um, fur ball is. I'll have to take your word for it if you sculpt this as an otter. But if you sculpted an otter that was in, uh, in the motion of swimming, um, it's a little easier to see their body, the, the length of their body, the taper of the tail, and, and what the otter's up to, um, that may not be as romantic as this, as this composition. Um, I, so that was just my two cents worth. Maybe I should shut the hell up because this is just a fine oh, no, no, composition the way it is. <laughs> when I thought about this, I thought about doing it with depth and three-dimensional where it has the folds and the body parts where they're emphasized maybe by a patina. Um, but I also thought about the swimming on water on yeah and having a base and maybe having a base that was not brass or whatever yeah. bronze well actually a bronze base would lend itself to a swimming one because you could get just one or two of the paws making contact with the bronze base and the rest of the piece the other paws and the body would all be kind of suspended and so the illusion no, so it'd be like barely touching the bottom of the riverbed yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, yeah that would um, work. So it's it's a way of creating the illusion of swimming. Um, and, we, and we do that an awful lot with um, all kinds of four-legged animals, um, like horses and stuff, where you want to have a galloping horse or something. Yeah, yeah. I guess it doesn't quite work with a galloping horse because they actually have... Yeah, it does because they have a three-point stray. There is actually one point where they're just on the tip of one hook. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, we call that cantilevering the form when it's only making contact with like one at one point, um, like on one hoof or something like that. And it makes a really dramatic presentation for the sculpture when it's got a little tiny cast bronze base down below to hold it up, but you're really doing it just for the display of the creature itself. So something to think about as you get into this. Yeah, bit. no, actually I, I did. I thought about that. And then I thought, well, I could make this a curled up palm thing and just give it greater detail. Um, it's not so small that I couldn't do that. And then I thought if I didn't have time, but I think, yeah, I like it. I like the idea of it being stretched out much better. Oh, well, okay. Well, thank you. You keep, keep working on that idea. I got to go to Zoe next. So if you could do a stop share for your screen and then Zoe and then Cassifer, Cassie after that. Um, Zoe, um, do you have anything that you want to tell us about? <laughs> uh, well, no, but also yes. <laughs> no. So I don't have an idea for, <laughs> so I know what I'm doing for like the, okay, right now I'm not sculpting, I'm knitting, which I mean is sculpting with yarn, but like. <sighs> yes. But um, basically, I only really have a solid idea for what I want to do for like the practice, like little tiny piece. I'm do, I'm gonna do like a pendant of the sword from Shira, ah. for 
a friend of mine. And if I like it enough, I might do a second one for myself because it's a very, very good show and it's a very cool sword. Okay. And on the note of weapons, my original like idea for like the big project was possibly doing like a decorative knife just because I think knives are cool and they can be really pretty. But I'm starting to think I might want to try something else. So I'm going to see how hard it is to sculpt the little swords and then make a decision. Excellent. That's a wise thing to do. Thank you very much for that. That's cool. Um, I'm going to try to unpin you, remove your pin and go, let's see, um, Cassie and then Cameron standing, stating, um, uh, Ms. Nash, are you there? It's, it, it, it's Cass and it's Mr. Nash. Mr. Nash, are you there? I'm yes. sorry. Um, so tell me, sir, um, what do you think about this class? Is, do you have I'm enjoying a, this a lot? No. No, seriously. Um, I've been looking forward to this class since fall because I talked to Chloe, my advisor, and she was like, you should probably do that. So uh, here I am. Um, I'm making an urn for my friend who just recently passed away. That's uh, right. Okay. Okay. I've got this. It's a wolf. Um, okay. I got to find you. Oh, there you are. Can I put you on? Uh, I'm going to add the pin and remove my pin and try to show your thing. Okay, so you're showing it up there. So, so there's, good there's that. Okay. I'm still working on it. I don't have the body finished, obviously, but there's okay. that. Um, I'm gonna try and cut it in half and then hollow out the center. Yeah. That way I can use part of that as a lid for his ashes. Right, right, right. Um, it, it might be easiest to just cut kind of an oval off of the back um, and, and have that be the removable lid part. Uh, mm -hmm. If you get the head involved in the um, lid, it makes it a lot more, the, the fitting right. and unfitting of the lid opening and closing gets a little bit more difficult. Um, you're not gonna be able to get a lot of ashes in there, but you'll get a sample in there. Is that okay with you? Yeah, no, we're not gonna take the whole thing because his family's right okay very good okay that's a huge project you got there that's fantastic so thank you for um for sharing that with us that's cool um let's see now i've lost myself how did i lose myself i'm coming back to me okay um so cameron stating and hunter van curler and who else is here zachary we talked to already emily if she's here and then Kylie Lively. So, um, Cameron, are you here? Uh, yeah. <laughs> did you want to? Did you want to um, share something um, with us? I don't know if you can see, but it's kind of like a squatting monkey type thing, you know, like a chimpanzee or an orangutan. You know, kind of get that uh, that muscle contour going on. <laughs> okay. Well, let me see. Can you hold it up to your camera, and I can just see it real quick? Uh, let's see if I could. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Oh my God, that's gonna be fun. That's gonna take a while to do. Try yeah. to keep it small if you can, because if, if you can keep it three or four inches in, in total height or smaller, it's gonna save you a ton of, of money on the bronze, okay? All right. And so, then also like, if it's something you wanna like mount it on like a plaque on the bottom or something, would you recommend having it so like you indent the hole to put a dowel in it or leave like a like a rod sticking out so you could put it into the mount like which would when be when when i mount bronze i kind of like to drill a hole into the place that's going to contact the base element especially if it's going to be a wooden base or something else so i will drill and then tap that hole for a bolt and we like to use stainless steel mounting hardware to mount these things um, and then I've been able to bolt them to bronze plates if I was going to use bronze as the base element. Or if you're using a piece of wood, we would countersink, uh, we would drill a countersunk hole from the bottom side um, so that would go up and then your screw would go into the countersunk portion of the wood and then up into um, the sculpture. And that would give you a blind um, uh, uh, fastener that you know nobody can see unless they tip it over and, and undo the bottom so that's yeah. kind of how we do that and we'll cross that bridge when we come to it first oh god you you're in for a big treat um uh, making a squatting seated um um 
great ape is going to be yeah. really, really hard. <laughs> yeah, it might end up being a little more abstract if I can't do it that well. So <laughs> okay. that's good. And, you know, that's good. Keep a, that helps to keep a positive outlook on this whole thing. Um, and abstraction is fine. Abstraction is great. So that's a, that's a good place to go. Um, let me just write this down. Um, I saw sort of a chimpanzee there, but um, whatever uh, it's going to be. Then Hunter Van Curler, are you here? Not really. Zachary, you told us a bunch of your stuff, and I forgot what it was. So can you say it again really quick? Um. I got, I have a dove and I have this little guy that's either, I don't know. I have a little guy and I have a dove. <laughs> okay, dove and a little guy. I got it. Okay. And then, yes, you can cast um, the um, aquatic stuff that your mom did too, because that looks really cool. Um, then Emily Wolf, uh, if she's here, I'd love to hear what you got. And then Kylie Lively, if you're still on the line, that'd be great. Emily, are you here? I'm here. Um, so I already have a, something sculpted a little. Is she? Okay, there you are. So tell us about it. So I thought about doing a little fox and I already have like a little. Oh, how big is that? Is that two or three inches tall? Yeah. That's beautiful. Is that a seated fox? Uh, it's just a fox. <laughs> I just thought about doing a fox and... Is it like the the portrait and the top um, uh, the top of the body, the upper legs, or is it the whole body kind of all uh, curled up? Yeah, I have the whole body, and then I have the like the tail wrapped around. Ah, I got it. Okay, I see. Very, very good. It's it's wonderful. You're having fun with that, aren't you? Yeah, I am. <laughs> and okay. uh, I also thought about doing a medium size sculpture. I wanted to do a bonsai tree. Oh my God. Yeah, you could try doing something like that. I know that you're very interested in, in Japanese um, things and a bonsai tree would be an awesome thing to do. The, the trunk and the, and the big branches or branch are, are relatively easy to do. As things taper down out to the ends of branches, that gets increasingly, increasingly harder to do as cast bronze sculpture. And especially if you're gonna get into foliage, um, you know, um, uh, foliage is quite thin and um, it, it becomes a really a big casting um, uh, challenge. So if you can, if you can look up cast bronze bonsai uh, sculptures and see if there is such a thing, maybe you can see how they go about abstracting the foliage and the, the tiny parts of the branches. And that would help me out quite a bit. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Last up would be Kylie. If you're still here, Kylie, are you here? And I'm going to pin myself again because I might have lost Kylie because she might have had to go to um, work or something because somebody is doing work when this class is happening. Let's see. Kylie, 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 Kylie. There we go. Well, you're here, but you're muted and you might have gone out of the room, so you might not be here right now. Okay, so I'm going to switch gears here and, and um, switch views. And so I've got a different camera here that I'm going to try. Not that camera, actually. That's my side camera, so I'll try this one. And so this is my bird's eye view. And so this, I've lowered my camera a lot closer to the tabletop, which, you know, zooms in a lot more on the sculpture that I'm working on. And so it gives you a little bit better view of working. Now, you guys probably don't have to watch me sculpt because it's, you know, probably a boring kind of a thing. But I just wanted to show you just a little bit more how I'm supporting the neck with the fingertips of my support hand and really trying to be careful to give good support to thin linear pieces while I'm trying to um, scrape. Scrape is such a terrible word in sculpture. While I'm trying to um, uh, refine the form. We're trying to refine form here. So I was able to um, get a form established through the additive process and it was very quick quick and dirty and nasty and wonderful and everything. And now we're trying to refine forms. I may have to take 
um, wax and actually stick it in my armpit to warm it up. And now this is where you guys can all say, ooh, gross, ooh, nasty. But it, you know, the sculpture doesn't care. And if you can put it either in your armpit or underneath your seat that you're sitting on, your body heat will warm up the wax pretty good. Um, you know, if you can bring this wax up from 65 degrees room temperature up to 98.6 degrees body temperature, then it's very malleable. And then it's, it's much better for coming back in here and filling in stuff. For instance, um, my jawline is not um, correct. I'm lower on this side and higher on this side of the cat. I was going to fill in a little bit on the one side with a little bit more wax form, but my cat is starting to look like a pig um, face. So I might have to work on my proportions a little bit to try to get this a little bit more into a cat-like um, shape and structure. So I may have to widen out my head on both sides and maybe try to get in here and establish my cat eyes pretty quickly. With the sculpting tool, you can push in with the sculpting tool and kind of make a uh, an eye-shaped dent like the um, uh, the eye socket. And if I can get the the um, shadow to catch it just right, there's a little bit of an eye socket there, and I can try to establish an eye socket on the other side just by pushing in with the sculpting tool. And of course, that looks like his eye got exploded or something. So you know, I'm going to be you push and pull, you try something and then you push it back you know, out again. And you just keep kind of playing and um, trying to do things. And then you keep looking at the, the sculpture to see, you know, do the two eyes balance, what's wrong? This one goes out too far to the side, but maybe I like the big eye and especially that eyelash. And maybe I'm gonna pick up just a little bit more um, wax with this tool and try to get that eyelash to do something similar so that I've got two eyes that are just a little bit more um, bilaterally symmetrical and balanced and that kind of thing. And so we're just going to be playing a lot with um, shape and shaping the jaw and the chin and the skull of this cat and trying to make the ears do something a little bit more like cat ears and a little bit less like the pig ears that I put on there when I just slapped a couple of pieces of wax on there in the first place. And when I, I carve off stuff with the tool, I'm gonna to wind up making a little pile of shavings and carvings. And then these, these piles of shavings and carvings can get picked up and very easily softened up with the warmth of just your fingertips again. And then they could come right back into the sculpture to help you build up other forms. I never really did figure out um, the shoulders for the, you know, how the cat's arms are going to work into um, the upper torso of the cat in the front or how the haunches of the uh, curled up um, um, legs in the back work. So now, now I am really hard pressed. I have to go in here and really figure this one out. I might even want to go and find that image on a Google image search and print the darn thing out like I told you guys to do, but I didn't do it either. So, um, you know, I'm, I may need that. Now, part of the abstraction on this particular cat was an elongation of form. And I may have to make the head longer to be um, kind of in keeping with the elongation of the neck form. So I may not be doing myself any favors at all by trying to make this head any fatter because it may want to be a much more elegant, narrow um, form. And so I'm going to kind of play with that a little bit. Oh my gosh, I've looked up at the clock just now and it's like seven o'clock, seven ten, um, And I've been uh, talking and at this for about an hour, which is probably super boring to you guys. What I usually like to do in this class is try to do a presentation, but only maybe, you know, 20 minutes or so. Um, 
just to get things rolling and to, to do a check-in with you guys. And then most of this class is supposed to be lab time, which means you guys are doing your own sculpture of your own pieces. When we are face-to-face -face in the classroom and you guys are working around lab tables, you can be talking with each other about stuff and that would be fine. But um, sculpting is primarily a solitary um, uh, process. And so what I may wanna do tonight is to just uh, call it a night and log off of this because I don't wanna make a three hour long recording for you guys. I'm, I have recorded this and so I'm gonna post this at our e-learning um, shell for this class. There is now an ART 244 e-learning shell for this class. And if you look at um, all of the tabs along the left side of the screen, there are um, you know, tabs for the main page and your login, um, Zoom uh, login will be there every time. So from now on, I don't want you guys waiting for me to send you an email or anything like that. I'd like you to go directly um, to the e-learning page for ART 244 and log in from the main page. Then another tab is um, Zoom recordings. And so that's where I'm putting all of these Zoom recordings so that you can come back and use them you know, if you want to. You can fast forward through all the boring parts and get to the things that I'm either talking about or um, demonstrating or that kind of thing, if that'll help you at all. Uh, I need to uh, break away from you guys so that I can get a sculpture started so that I can come back and do some really good um, demonstrating on one of my own pieces for the next class. So I'm going to call it a night for now and say goodbye to everybody. Oh, Kylie's here, uh, running back and forth. Kylie, did you want to tell us what kind of sculpture you were going to make for this class? Do you have an idea? Where is Kylie's? She's still thing? muted. She's still muted. Well, we got to unmute her. And uh, how do I unmute her? I don't know. She has to unmute herself. She has I'm going to gonna call herself. it a night. We'll see you the next time around, Fritz. Okay. All right. All right. So um, we're not going to talk to Kylie because Kylie doesn't want to talk to us. So we're going to talk to She's probably running back and forth She's again. She's right here. <laughs> She's right here. I'm here. All right. Do you want to tell us what you're doing really briefly before we all call it a night for tonight? So I've actually picked out a fox. A fox. I really like um, the breast fur and how you detail it and the tail. So that's something I'd like to do. Okay, that sounds great. And again, if you can keep it relatively small, it'll make for a relatively inexpensive casting. So three or four inches in height would be fantastic. Is this fox going to be sitting up on its haunches by any chance? So I am going to do three different poses. There's one with it on its haunches, um, one where it's prone, and then another where it's on its legs. I kind of thought I'd go with all of them and kind of see where it leads me. Running Fox. Okay, that sounds fantastic. So um, that's a very ambitious amount of sculpting to do. If you can get all of those done and get at least one of them cast, that would be fantastic and definitely an A, you know, for the quarter. I am pretty artsy. I'm going to throw it out there. Oh, okay. The gauntlet has been thrown down. The challenge has been made. She is artsy. Look out, everybody else. Okay. <laughs> All right. On that happy note, I'm going to call it a night, too. So I'm going to say goodbye to everybody, and we'll see you again on Wednesday night. Good luck with the sculpture. Bye. Bye. Goodbye. Bye.